Richard Foss is a man who doesn't need much introduction if, you, if you're involved with audio networking in any way. Um, lecturer and our supervisor on, at Rhodes University and chair of the um, AES specification group working on the audio networking protocols. Mm -hmm. Is that AES 67? Yeah, AES 67 and AES 70 now also. That's, yeah, that's the OCA thing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's quite a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, this talk, I assume, concerns the um, eliminating by force of the unidirectional point-to-point -point nature of MIDI. Right. Yeah, I'll let you get on with it. it. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so this is actually nothing about the uh, AES working group stuff. It's something that we did quite a time back, actually started in the early 90s, and we were trying to do trying to get, actually on the campus, just remote access to studios um, because we had limited resources and trying to get different workstations across the campus accessing studios. So the motivation, as said here, was to increase the MIDI control distance and, of course, reduce wiring and allow for simple MIDI connection management. Oh, and Janus, maybe that's a word you could use, MIDI net. <laughs> Donated to you. Um, and we wanted to, okay, so how do we increase the MIDI control distance? Well, um, at the time that we were working, LANs became prevalent, and so we thought, well, let's use a network. Um, and to enable easy MIDI connection management, well, just have a number of workstations on, on the network, which we'd call MIDI net units. Um, so that's the sort of configuration that we had and have, and actually this type of configuration we've got in our, I've you know, taught for some time at Rhodes University, and it's quite a nice student exercise to build this thing. You've got labs with multiple workstations, and they're all etherneted up, and you've got MIDI coming out of the workstations as well. So that's the configuration, a bunch of um, MIDI workstations, and each connected to their MIDI devices. So you might want to connect something like a little controller across to a 01V96, and it's a really simple user interface. You just see all your devices with their MIDI ports, all the input ports across the whole network, and you see all the output ports. You just click on an input, click on an output, and you connect, and then you can disconnect as well. So that will allow MIDI to flow um, across the network to, to there. Okay, so I thought I'd bring a bit of... Um, design up as well, because it sort of shows what each MIDI net unit contains. It's not that clear. Um, so, um, gosh, it hasn't come out clearly at all. But anyway, um, across the network, you've got for a particular MIDI net unit, you've got remote MIDI net units and itself, its own MIDI net unit. So that's a local MIDI net unit with its input ports and output ports. There's a, a remote MIDI net unit with its input ports and output ports. On the network, we've got an aggregation of um, MIDI net units, remote MIDI net units. That's just the control window, um, and then MIDI devices connected to your in and out ports. So the, the UML just reflects what the configuration is. Okay, so, um, and then this is just a, a um, header file from the, the MIDI net unit which contains this very simple protocol, which just has a bunch of, it's, it's all done in UDP, so, um, and we multicast out the, use the multicast for the protocol. So there's a, me, the MIDI net unit, is saying who's out there, and everyone who's out there has the whole MIDI net configuration, and so back comes I'm here, and then me says how hey, I want to get the configuration, and back comes the configuration as a bunch of input ports, output ports, MIDI net units. When you make a connection, there's a connect message. When you're routing messages, they packed into UDP packets, and uh, so they'll come across with that um, type, message type. There are sysx messages and um, uh, deletes, and so it goes on. So everything's multicasted. And then each MIDI net unit has a particular series of states that it goes up, goes through from startup to configuring to having all the remote units configured inside it and now fully configured. Okay, so that's just the header file. As I said, a very simple protocol. Um, and 
just showing one thread of the, the actual networking thread, where you just receive the, um, the MIDINET message and then, of course, run through the protocol saying, is, there, is this a who is there message? And if so, say, I'm here. And if you get an I'm here message, well, then you do a configuration request. In comes your configuration request. And then you send out information about all the MIDINET units and the connections that you've got and the, and the ports. And here's a MIDI message that you just ask to root MIDI. So, um, yeah, a bunch of messages fulfilling the protocol and conforming, I think, as you can see, to what the UML was. Okay, so we wanted to just play around with remote device control um, with this MIDINET protocol. Um, so we have, um, this is the, I think this is the Yamaha 01V96 control application. And what you can, of course, do on a MIDI-net unit is you can have a, um, a virtual MIDI driver with its, with its outs and ins. So you hook up your control application to the out. MIDI -net, the MIDI-net software will pick up from that MIDI in if you've made the necessary connection. Okay. And this just happens to be the loop B virtual MIDI driver. And then you can control over here and go across have your MIDI messages routed through there, through across the network to your actual O1V96. So it was a bit of um, showing somehow how remote studio control can happen. Okay. Um, we ha I had a f bit of problems with the current um, uh, mixer control software, which in a way, it enhanced the control surface of, and this, this was all done actually sort of 2006, 2007-ish, um, this current, this next application, which was a postgrad that did it. Um, so we were looking at that sort of mixer control application and felt that the signal path wasn't that easy to follow. I mean, it was giving a bit better than what the control surface was. Um, but I was looking for something a bit different. And so I think typically as engineers, as audio engineers do, they go across to the, um, to the, uh, the block diagram of what the mixing console actually is. And in such a mixing console, you know, if we just look at it broadly, there are places where patching's done, like patching's done over there, patching's done over there, and patching's done down here. And then signal processing is done over here, signal processing is done over there, signal processing is done over here. So um, what, you, what I typically do is I look at something like this, a, um, a block diagram of a mixing console, and then I sort of trace through my channels, <coughs> through to the buses, and then out. And I try and get an understanding of the mixing console that way, and then I have to translate it into what the control surface actually is. So I thought there was possibly a better way of representing that. Um, so the patching, I thought, could be just done like this. And this is what the application is. And this is written in Juice. Um, so we just have the, um, the inputs, the analog inputs to the mixing console. And one can simply you know, click on the little um, what are Juice buttons to um, to patch across to the various channels. And similarly, here's for, for bus patching, going from your channels to the various bus, um, bus inputs. Um, so that's all fine for the patching, but that's sort of in the heart of the mixing console. Um, so this is showing a bit of but something a bit um, more incorporating signal processing as well. So you can just click on um, a particular channel, and then that will open up. To, to show you um, your parametric equalization, your compression, whatever else, whatever, whatever other capabilities, and this is an, is an example of the O1V96, um, whatever capabilities that mixing console provides for you. And if you click on a, a matrix patch point, then it'll, if, if it does provide volume at that point, well, then you've got it. So it was a bit more intuitive for me um, from a mixing console block diagram to the actual control, because I would go from my um, 
analog input, I'd patch. At that patch point, maybe find I could mix, um, go to the channel, change something on the channel, go to the bus, and then click on the bus, and then change that. And so follow the signal path and do the processing. OK. Um, so this thing we called uh, a matrix mixer to show the, the grid-based um, approach. And at the time, we were working with, we had three uh, consoles in the, in the department. Um, so we had the, the ONX, ONV96, and O3D, all Yamaha and all MIDI controllable. Um, so we wanted to just write one matrix mixer application and have it um, capable of controlling all the different mixing consoles. So we, we thought, well, let's, let's have a configuration file that's different and separate for each of the, the devices. So um, we decided to use XML. That seemed to be the right way to go. Um, and we've got XML elements and attributes that describe the various signal processing points, as I pointed out previously. Um, the parameters at each signal processing point, for example, volume and equalization parameters. And then also what the MIDI messages are that the manufacturer require for that particular patch point or for the or for the particular signal processing point. So I'll just run through that um, XML briefly here. Um, so for example, here we are doing a patch point. So there's, um, there's an input name, AD1, which appears, AD2, so the analog, two analog inputs, and then the name of the channel, and then the name of a, of a patch that can be made from AD1 to channel 1. Okay. So that all gets laid out um, for, every, um, for every patch point you want to make for every input. Um, this link, um, link 1, just says, well, we've, we can get some XML code for, for this um, particular one, and we can have others refer to that same code. Okay, so a parameter, the parameter description XML, um, there might be, for example, on that AD1, there's no signal processing that happens. It happens in the channel. Um, but there's signal processing on a particular channel here. So there's a volume parameter. We give it a name, and um, we can have a mute or a, or a volume parameter. And then that can be expanded out um, to show the actual... MIDI message that's going to be sent in a system exclusive one in this case, um, where we have a, uh, the, the volume parameter that's going to have a particular message, and it's a, we've got switch and range type messages, so the volume of, you know, you've got a particular range which you can move the volume with, and uh, have an XML element that says this is the start part of the MIDI system exclusive message. Um, this is the variable part, those, um, that part over there, and then an end part um, giving a, a, the, the end of the system exclusive. Okay, so, so the idea was that we'd, we'd um, uh, provide for the O and X, it'll be one thing for the O3D, another, and some pretty similar, of course, with, with the Yamaha consoles. But then we thought, well, you know, there are a number of networking protocols coming out, and um, you know, there's, gosh, there's OSC, there's OCA, there's AES64, AES64, AES70 now is the OCA one. Maybe we can just have a, a like, particular protocol type um, and put the information down for that particular protocol type and mixing consoles that conform to particular protocols, we can have a similar configuration arrangement. But we haven't done that. We've just done that for MIDI with a with a range of quite tightly similar consoles. OK, so um, then I just wanted to, as a last part of this talk, just introduce something. Uh, MIDI-Net got revived. <laughs> it happened early 90s, and, and I talked with it a bit. Um, and then we had this project, of course, for co console control. And uh, a st student who'd been through the third year course decided he wanted to try wireless. So we decided, well, let's try MIDI-Net on wireless. Um, so the 
problem with um, the current MIDI net configuration is, of course, you've got MIDI net units that are workstations, and that's pretty cumbersome. And they're also wired together. There are a lot of point-to-point -point wireless MIDI solutions out there, um, but we thought, how's about wireless routing? Um, we've been using, uh, we've, we've got quite a lot into Ethernet AVB in, in, the, in the department and with my own work. Um, so, and hence we've been using XMOS devices quite a lot, so we thought, well, let's try using XMOS to do this wireless routing. And XMOS came out with a slice kit, as some of you might know, and we thought, let's have that as our MIDI net unit. That has a, an, uh, the slice kit that we're using has an XMOS processor, a Wi-Fi slice, and an audio MIDI slice. So this is the sort of configuration that we're building. Um, so these are just two slice kits. That's the Wi-Fi slice. That's the audio MIDI slice. This is just a JTAG connector for programming it. Um, and so it links up a bit, as I was saying to Janos, with his uh, project because we're doing not processing control or signal processing control, but connection management control. Um, the, uh, the slice kit, this Wi-Fi slice has a little web server on it. So we can take any mobile device, for example, and use a web browser and connect up to this. And, uh, and I'll show you the design that we've got um, shortly. So this is the idea then, is that you come with your browser and this was an emulation of the system. You come with a device manager, you see your devices, you get see all their IP addresses, you can give them actual proper names, and then you do connection management. Once again, simply just as we have in the in the MIDI, in the current wired MIDI net unit. So the design looks like this, and most of it is complete except for one niggly part, which is Getting UDP, the thing that XMOS didn't provide for us was a, a stack below the Wi-Fi that did UDP. So MidiNet we've ported at C++ and ported across to the um, XMOS device. We have the web server running. Um, so how does this stuff all work? We did a MIDI handler as well, had to do that for the XMOS device. So um, MIDI messages come in, they go to the MIDI handler. They get routed by the MIDI-Net um, C++ code and head out over Wi-Fi to, to other units according to the MIDI-Net protocol. So those MIDI messages will be routed across. Um, they, they broadcast, and any MIDI-Net unit just picks up those broadcast MIDI messages, looks at the um, sender, and says, OK, I've got a connection to my MIDI output port, for example, um, from that sender, so I just push it out the the MIDI. So messages coming, MIDI, MIDI net messages coming over Wi-Fi go across to MIDI net, determination of whether there is a connection and send out to the MIDI output. Um, on a user with a mobile device um, sends browser requests, these go across to the web server and are taken up, sent across to the MIDI net unit so the MIDI net unit can uh, fulfill its what I showed is a UML design with all its connections. Um, when connection messages come across over the Wi-Fi to the MIDI net unit, it then uses dynamic HTML to supplement the page that the web server's got and then sends it out to the mobile device. Um, yeah, out to the mobile device. Okay, um, I think that's actually... Done. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, sure. Do you have any questions or things to add? I would like to ask whether the user interface that you have shown, uh, is it generated automatically from the XML description or is, is it a separate? Oh, work? we don't have any XML description in this. I was using the XML description for the for the, only for oh, the, the sorry, points. the user interface is generated from the XML description for the O1V96 thing. Yes, the, yes, the, the routing. That, that, that's, that's generated from the configuration file. So yeah. it's dynamically loaded. It, it means that yes. um, if you change something, then it will uh, rearrange. It the, will rearrange, yeah, ah. that's right. Well, maybe you have solved the 
problem. That <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. What sort of latencies are we seeing across the network? That's okay. You've done it for um, Do you mean, well, with the wired network, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't recall that. It's going to be one of our problems. I know we're going to be looking at that closely with Wi-Fi. Um, but I, off the top of my head, I, I think it was around, we were around three milliseconds, but I, I can't remember exactly what that was. With the wired? With the wired one, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can find the dot and answer that for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you use uh, error recovery for wireless for, for the wireless network? No, we um, to be honest, it's it's a post grad student working on it at the moment and we're just trying to get the thing going before we think of error recovery. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not at that stage. Yeah. Yeah. But what does concern us is latency, because I'm just not sure whether it's going to be sufficient for latency. I mean, you know, setting up a mixing console and maybe making changes fine, but the, the real-time routing, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that. There, there, there are some, there, there's um, a guy called um, Floros, Andreas Floros, in, actually at a university in Greece that, are, that is working on fast uh, wireless transmission for, for control applications. So we might well be communicating with him. Yeah. yeah. Has this been picked up in any commercial products out there? Because you know, I've noticed this trend recently in a lot of iPad controlled mixing desks, which yeah. would, uh, you know, something like this would be, I'm not sure if they're using um, their own proprietary method we for each manufacturer with, or not? We worked with Rich, for the MIDI net, we worked with Richmond Sound Design. They were interested in it. That's, mm. a, that's a stage and lighting control company. Um, in fact, Charlie Richmond did the, the MIDI spec for, um, for theater control applications. So we worked with him with MIDI net and he did a version of that. But, um, and then I did... Um, one or two people were using it for, for synchronizing um, their, their computers. If they had more, more than one workstation and weren't getting enough um, sufficient, uh, if the latency was too high with their, with their multiple tracks of workstations, they would sync with MIDI-NET. But that wasn't really commercial. It was just people interested in using it. The only commercial one is, is, the, is the, the Charlie Richmond one. But the, recently, I, I actually was at the AES um, showing the starts of this wireless one um, in, in New York, and, and a person came up to me and said, Copperlan has done something similar. Do you, do you, you yeah, I'm seeing a shaking of the head, um, nodding of the head. Um, so I looked at their thing recently, but I haven't seen how it, really how it differs from us. It's a more graphical approach. So they, um, um, I, I need to work with Copperlan yeah, and, and see how, what the latency difference is and how it varies from ours.